<sighs> Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. There we go. You heard uh, the peanut gallery joining in on your welcome to worship today. I'm Reverend Joel, and on behalf of Kate and Reverend Caitlin, we are so glad you are here at worship with us today. If you happen to be visiting with us here at the Presbyterian Church of Chestertown, we want you to know that we might be the ones in row leading here the virtual worship experience, but the real ministers of this church are her members, and they are wisely tucked in to their sofas and breakfast tables today, enjoying worship with you through YouTube. Uh, we hope you will want to know more about us in the weeks and months ahead and when the day comes that we can regather in this space that you will join us. I'm so proud of this congregation. Y'all showed up and did the drive-by birthday party for Miss Jenny. That was a beautiful thing to see happen and it was amazing to see the line stretch down the road in the, what's normally the tractor lane for about a half a mile. Y'all just did beautifully uh, trying to find some wonderful way to say happy birthday to her and still honor the social distancing. Good job, church. Uh, we are about to head in, we don't have any other big announcements for today, but we're about to head into this time of worship. So let's pause and prepare our hearts and minds for worship with song. Please responsibly join me in our call to worship. The shepherd calls us by name. Our shepherd leads us to abundant life. We hear your voice and turn. We hurry to drop everything and follow. The shepherd prepares a table. Our shepherd lavishly pours out life. We hear your invitation to gather. We are excited to find ourselves at a feast. The shepherd gathers us in. The shepherd welcomes us all to the house of the Lord. Let us worship God.
Friends, let us gather our hearts together as we talk with God and confess with God our own brokenness. Together, let us pray. Living Lord, by the power of Holy Spirit, you are calling us toward the new normal of your beloved community, your coming kingdom. Yet, like the first disciples, we hesitate to move anything, even ourselves, towards your kingdom. We have not ever walked this new path, so we pause, longing to turn back down more familiar paths. We have not heard these new truths, so we pause, aching to hold on to our own beliefs of how things are or should be. We have not yet experienced your fullness of life, so we pause, pining to get back to our normal lives instead of finding new life in you. Open our eyes, minds, hearts, and our spirit to trust you. Guide us faithfully forward toward the new normal of beloved community on earth as it is in heaven, where all your people are loved, fed, healed, and welcomed. Help us, God. Brothers and sisters, last week we heard we are reborn into the family, the household, the community of God. And this week in our prayer of confession, we see how hard it is to be a part of that family, how different it might feel. But we are here to remember the only one in a position to condemn or to judge us for anything is Jesus the Christ. And he was born for us. He died for us, he rose again for us, and he prays for us. In him, all the old is washed away and a new is begun. We are forgiven and can be at peace with God, with ourselves, and with one another. May all God's people say, Amen. Please pause with me for our prayer of illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, so that as we read and hear your scripture, your word is proclaimed, and we hear with joy what you are saying to us today. Amen. Our scripture reading is Psalm 16, 116, verses 1 through 8. Please join me responsively. I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. The cords of death entangle me. The anguish of the grave came over me. I was overcome by distress and sorrow. Then I called on the name of the Lord. Lord, save me. The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. The Lord protects the unwary. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return to your rest, my soul, for the Lord has been good to you. For you, Lord, have delivered me from death, my, fear, my, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, children and children at heart. Um, today's children's sermon is actually coming to you from my house because I want to introduce you to two of the people, well, 
not people, you'll see why, but two friends that I'm quarantining with who, if you've been to our church before, you've heard me talk about them, but today you get to meet Rocky and Layla. This is Rocky. Layla's way down there. He's very friendly. Now, when we come out here, when Dan and I come out here, they know us, they recognize us, they know our voices, so they come to us. But if one of you was here and you came out, they wouldn't recognize you. And well, Rocky might come running, but Layla, she's a little less social. And I wanna tell you a story that Jesus tells in the gospels about sheep and their shepherds. And this comes from John chapter 10. Verses 1 to 10. Very truly I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by another way, is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus says that the sheep listen to the shepherds because they know their voice, just like Rocky and Layla know my voice and they know Danny's voice and they listen and come to us. But Jesus says he's kind of like a shepherd that Jesus speaks to us and that we know to listen to him and we know to follow him. There will be times in our lives where we hear different voices and we are in situations where we don't hear Jesus's voice. And those times are hard and it's okay, that happens to all of us. But we should always listen. Listen for Jesus's words guiding us. Listen for Jesus's words of comfort when we need them. Jesus always speaks, he promises that to us. And so let us listen for Jesus's voice, the way that Rocky listens for us at breakfast time. Let's pray together. I invite you to pray with me at home um, and repeat after me. Dear Jesus, thank you for speaking to us. Help us to listen, even when it's hard, to hear your voice. Amen. Last week we started a new sermon series. Caitlin and I are calling The New Normal. We're looking at Jesus' disciple, Peter, and the big change he went through because of Easter from the guy who tried to stop Jesus and deny Jesus three times before the sun rose to the powerful prophet and pastoral preacher. And Caitlin and I are wondering what we can learn from Peter as we, the church, come out of this odd season of isolation and social distancing. What will the new normal of church and life be like for us on the other side of all this coronavirus culture? Last week we read 1 Peter 1, and I suggested Peter is describing us all as reborn out of our old lives into the new coming household of God because of Christ. Therefore, we are now one family and one household of God. And we're letting go of anything that doesn't welcome or accelerate the arrival of God's coming community as the new normal for all God's children. And I'm really grateful for the ways y'all are responding to this message to talk about a new normal can bring up in us several different feelings. Maybe sadness for what we enjoyed that, that new normal seems to suggest we won't get back. Maybe frustration 
that things have changed so much, so fast, beyond our control, maybe even anger. That new normal feels in some way like we're surrendering to this disease instead of fighting to get our lives back. Those emotions are normal and they, they're okay as we talk about what we are losing. But here's why I'm grateful. Some of you are realizing we don't lose any of the good, the beautiful in the new normal. All the good and the beautiful and the loving, those things are amplified in the new normal, the coming kingdom. All we are losing are the former habits, the thoughts, the beliefs, the practices that resist the coming kingdom, God's community for all God's people. Now this week we're going into 1 Peter a little deeper. We're gonna read from chapter two, I need your patience and care as we read a delicate text. I'm gonna do my best to speak carefully and responsibly and honestly and faithfully, and I hope you will try to hear what was normal for them and what became the new normal for them because of Jesus. And then we will see if we can hear and feel that same Jesus pulling us from our old normals toward the new normal of God's coming kingdom in some beautiful, hopeful ways as well. Now, I've done some work on the Greek this week and made my own translation edit, so what you're gonna hear me read, it won't match exactly the words I'm gonna put on the screen. I hope my translation gives some clarity to us for our time and culture. Uh, let's pray, then listen for the word of the Lord from 1 Peter 2. Here we come, God, into your scripture, your word. May it open something in us, illumine something in us so that we see ourselves as your servants. And we are so happy to serve you and help bring kingdom come. It's to you and you alone, I pray. Amen. 1 Peter 2, verses 11 to 25, listen again for the word of the Lord. Dearest friends, I urge you as immigrants and outcasts to refrain from mistaken desires which wage war against your own spirit. Live such good lives among the others that though they may accuse you of doing wrong, they may also see your good deeds and glorify God on the day God visits us all. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the highest human authority or to the governors who are sent by the emperor to punish those who do wrong by them and to commend those who do right by them. Yet it is God's will that by doing God's good, you will silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as if you are free people, but don't use your freedom as an excuse for getting away with doing evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the household of believers. Worship God. Honor the emperor. And slaves in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your emperors and rulers, not only to those who are good and considerate, but even to those who are harsh. See, it's commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because their conscience is with God. But how is it to your credit if you receive repercussions for doing wrong by God and endure the sufferings that come from that? But if you suffer for doing God's good and you keep doing the good despite the suffering, that is commendable before God. To this you were called. Like Christ suffered for you, you are left him and his suffering as an example that you might follow in his steps. He, the one who committed no sin and in whom no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled insults at him, he didn't retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, 
He entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our mistakes in his body to the cross so that we might also die to our sins and live for his holiness, his justice, his peace. By his wounds, you've already been healed. For before you were like sheep, running, scattered, lost. And now you've returned to the shepherd as steward of your very lives. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. To be a follower of Christ in the new normal, the coming community of God, means three things. One, in the culture, we might be considered strange and be outcasts. Two, in our communities where others have power over us, we will be nonviolent and obedient to God first and human authorities second. And third, in our new normal, the household of God, we will be equals at the lowest level. Let's walk through all three of these. First, in Peter's time, what was the old and new normal for them? And then see what that might mean for us as we move from our old to new normal in our time. First, Peter names all Christians he's writing to regardless of their location or status, as immigrants and outcasts. They're not mainstream anywhere. They're different everywhere. Not by how they look, but by how they act, what they say and do. As they move through their different cultures and countries, being followers of Christ is obvious in any culture or any nation other than the kingdom of God itself. They're strange. They're strangers. They're perceived as outsiders, as immigrants. And because of this, they find themselves cast out, suffering ridicule or pressure to conform or get out. Peter reminds them to resist conforming. To do so would split them inside themselves, make them hypocrites, what Peter calls a war against your own nature or your own spirit. He instructs them to continue living, speaking, acting publicly in such a way that may make others uncomfortable, that may attract ridicule or resistance or anger from others, and that's okay. Do it anyway. Be so good and true to God and God's goodness and God's coming community that in the end, all will see and be grateful for God and God's goodness. That's the first new normal lesson. When we follow God, we'll be perceived as strange and might be outcast. Second, we're called to be obedient to God and then all human authorities. We are to be faithful to God no matter what, and not just privately or secretly or spiritually, but publicly and bodily and boldly. All of our words and actions are accountable to God. Then, as we are able, also submit ourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, the emperor or the emperor's governors. Now, they, the human authorities, will have their own definition of what is good and right. Our actions must do good and right by God. And in obeying God, we might be perceived by human rulers as being disobedient to them and be punished by them, our human authorities. That's okay. That's our calling in the new normal, doing God's good, even when the emperor or governors have different opinions of good, and doing that, doing God's good, despite the conflict with emperors or governors, it will eventually silence what Peter says is the ignorant talk of foolish people. Now, should we fight our human authorities, mutiny against them, undermine them? No. If when human rulers and authorities judge God's people's actions as wrong, 
the human authorities and rulers will insult or threaten or restrict us. But God's people, by Christ's example, do not retaliate in violence. They make no threats. When human authorities don't like our obedience to God, we are to be non-violently obedient to God anyway. God's people keep on doing what is good and right by God. We obey and follow God and might suffer under our mistaken, ignorant, foolish human authorities. When that happens, we trust ourselves to the only true judge in our lives, God and God alone. That's the second lesson of new normal. Third lesson. In this new family that we've been reborn into, the household of God, we are all equals, but at the lowest level. In normal households of Peter's time, there were levels of power and authority and freedom. The male, I know, I'm sorry, was the head of the household, had all the power and authority, and was the only one with really any freedom. And then women were next. They had no power or authority over the men, but on the men's behalf, they did have power over the children or the servants, and next were the children. And while all children were under the women, boy children had certain powers and authorities and privilege that girls didn't. When boys grew up, they became men. When girls grew up, they became property of a man. And all of this was their old normal back then. Also normal back then was slaves. Now, there were two Greek words used for these slaves. Human beings owned property of other human beings. I know, I know I am with you. But it was their old normal. The two different words that Greek uses for slaves. English, we translate them both as slaves, but there is a difference. And Peter uses one of them on purpose here. The more common term was douloi. The less common term was oiketai. Douloi and oiketai were both slaves. They were both owned property of other human beings. And in their world, that was still normal. Duloy worked in the fields and farms and factories and shops, and they lived somewhere else. Oiketai worked in the household with the family and lived in the household with the family. The word Peter uses here for us, reborn into the household of God, is oiketai. We are reborn as slaves into the household of God. We work for the household of God. We are in the household of God, but we have no power, no privilege, no authority over anyone. In the new normal of the coming kingdom of God, no one yields power privilege or authority or control over anyone else in God's community. All people in God's household, older or younger, more male or more female, wealthier or poorer, former slaves or former free, all of us find ourselves suddenly equal. Not by moving up in some of our traditional understandings of power or privilege, but by becoming equal servants, equal to one another, equally bound to serve the whole community with no degrees of power or privilege or authority over one another anymore. That's the third lesson of new normal. Now, this new community, this new normal, this 
new kingdom of God. It's, it's obviously not here yet. It's coming. The tomb is empty. Jesus has been teaching about it and has given us a glimpse of it and has promised to bring it. In his death, we all died to our old normals, all of our old identifiers that divide us or give us power or privilege over one another or make us submit to the powers or privileges or authorities of others. All those are gone. We are already reborn into the new community and we are already equal, but we're not really equal yet, are we? Because the coming community isn't fully here yet. But if we look around, we can easily see the ways it isn't here yet. We see people suffering because too much of our world is under ignorant, foolish, or harsh human authorities who either don't know God's kingdom very well or worse, they know it. They just don't want it to come on earth as it is in heaven because they would lose too much, too much power and control and privilege over others. So what shall we do until it comes to help it come? Peter's advice to them and to us is to make everything we say and do build God's household, God's community here and now. And when we do, we'll be perceived as strange and we might be outcasts. Follow God anyway. When we do, our human authorities might judge us or punish us for not obeying their definitions of right or wrong. Obey them where we can, but follow God anyway without any violence or threat against our mistaken human authorities. And when we do voluntarily lay down any powers or privileges we individually have over one another and become equals with those this world says are the least that sounds hard. Follow God anyway. See, every power and privilege Jesus did have, he laid down to be united with us and all his brothers and sisters. Jesus spoke and acted in ways that lifted up the fullness of true community of God as more important than any human institution, ruler, or kingdom. He was ridiculed for it, rejected as an outsider. He was called an instigator. He was punished even with death on a cross, but he never stopped following God and he never fought back with violence or threat. That Jesus rose from the dead on Easter morning and is now the cornerstone of the great new community, our new normal, the household of God. And we are reborn already into that community. So let's be built onto him and help build that community for all God's people. To God be all the glory and honor now and forevermore. Amen. Please join me in our affirmation of faith. The reconciling work of Jesus was a supreme crisis in the life of humankind, both personal crisis and present hope for us. Holy Spirit brings God's forgiveness to us, moves us to respond, and initiates our new life in Christ. The new life takes shape in a community in which we know God's love and accepts us. We therefore accept ourselves and love others. The new life does not release anyone from conflict with unbelief, pride, lust, or fear. Nevertheless, as we mature, we live into freedom and good cheer, bearing witness on good and evil days. The new life finds its direction in the life of Jesus. We seek the good of humankind in cooperation with powers and authorities, but we have to fight against pretensions and injustices when these same powers endanger human welfare. The new life is eternal. The resurrection is God's sign. God will consummate the work of creation and reconciling, reconciliation beyond death and bring to fulfillment the new life begun in Christ. 
As we gather together for this moment of intentional prayer in our service, we remind you um, that if you have prayer requests, that you can send those to an email address, which uh, Reverend Joel and I both see, prayers at presbyterianchestertown.org. Every Wednesday, we send out an email with all of those prayers, and the new prayers that we have received, I will include in our prayer this morning. So let us pray. Just like your disciples long ago, we peer into the tombs of our hearts. So many things fill our inner tombs. Broken relationships, failed attempts at self-improvement, shame, anger, missed opportunities, debilitating grief. Lord, some pieces of ourselves feel like they have been dead forever and other things so affect our living that although we breathe, we feel dead within. We lift up to you all that is within us. When those who came to your tomb looked within, they found two men in dazzling clothes but couldn't find you. So often we too go through difficult times and can't find you. Perhaps we too are looking in the wrong places. You are always with us, but often in ways that defy our expectations. Just as the tomb couldn't limit you, neither can we. Open our minds, ears, eyes, and hearts to all the ways that you dwell in our midst. Lord, there is no tomb that you cannot break through, including the tombs in our hearts. May we experience your resurrection inside and out. May we experience life in places that we thought were dead. May we experience your reconciliation in relationships that we thought were damaged forever. May we find your peace in things that once gave us anxiety. May we experience healing in the places that have been hurting for too long. May we see your presence in all the times that we always thought we were alone. On this day, we give thanks to you for the gift of life, especially for John and Gillian Ames's new granddaughter, Lutanda. We seek your peace and healing and presence for Leon and Ellie, who are grieving the loss of their spouses, for Kathy Hill, for George Burris, for Cindy King, and Michael Wallace. For our community and nation and world grappling with COVID and its effects on us. We pray for ourselves and for others seeking to be faithful to you in these abnormal times. We remember especially our neighbors of Shrewsbury Episcopal for all of at Presbyterian Church in Bear, Delaware, our partners in Newcastle Presbytery, for the Reformed Church in Hungary, and our, for our beloved covenant partners of the Matiki Presbyterian Church in Malawi. Oh God, as we celebrate the empty tomb, we rejoice that death does not have the final victory, but rather that life, love, and goodness prevail. Lord, break open our lives to receive all the love, forgiveness, and freedom that you so freely give. May we allow your resurrection to make a difference in how we live. May we forever live in hope of all that is yet to be as we pray together the prayer that you have given to us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, this is a strange time for all of us. And we want to remind you that if you have been affected personally by the situation in our world, and that your giving needs to change, that's absolutely fine. We are okay with that. And we wanna support you if we can, just let us know. 
Um, but if you are able to keep giving the way that you want to, you are invited to do that by mailing your uh, offering to the church. You can set that up through your online bill pay, or you can visit our website and give through PayPal. And we are gifted with a offertory today from Sue and Hannah Caswell. Um, let us enjoy that as we bring our offerings to God. I come to the garden alone, while the dew is still on the roses, and the voice I hear falling on. Sit. <laughs> Sit. Thank you. Yes, yes. This sweet fella is Neville. This is our dog. Last week, his normal was living in a home with Jill and Daniel in Georgia. But Jill and I met halfway in a Home Depot parking lot and handed him off as our move gets closer and closer. He's now out from under her feet as she packs up the house. And he is experiencing a lot of new normals right now. I find him shivering sometimes, cuddling up with me and getting as close as he can to me because I might be his one and only normal in the midst of all this strangeness. Brothers and sisters, it does feel weird to be in the new normal of the coming kingdom of God. 
but know that Jesus the Christ is right here beside us. And if we shiver or worry about the new normal, he's got us, he's with us, and he'll be with us all the way to the end. No matter how much we might be ridiculed or outcast, no matter how much we might suffer under someone else's version of right and wrong, following God is a beautiful way to help kingdom come. <laughs> now blessing, laughter, and loving be yours, and may the love of a great God who names you and holds you as the earth turns and flowers grow be with you this day, this night, this moment, and forevermore. Amen. You okay? I, I know, buddy, I know.